All right, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the afternoon session. My name is Tumbi Mwangi. I am a professor of epidemiology at the University of uh, Nairobi and Washington State University. Um, and this afternoon we have got lined up pretty really nice presentations. Uh, we'll begin with one by a good friend of mine, uh, Bernard Gwanda, Dr. Bernard Gwanda from uh, National Museums of Kenya. Uh, he has nearly 20 years of uh, working in the National Museums of Kenya, 19 years to be exact. And today he's speaking to us on the Crimean Congo hemorrhag uh, hemorrhagic fever, virus in humans, animals and ticks in Kenya. Please, welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I think I'm privileged to talk to you when you have a little bit of more energy. In the name of Sugar After Lunch, I will make this presentation very brief. Uh, thanks, Dr. Tumbi, for inviting me. <clears throat> uh, this work I'm going to present is, uh, the portion I'm presenting is uh, a small bit, bit of it. We're interested in tracking Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus in Kenya in all possible places we can get it, animals in the wild, animals at home, as well as human beings. <clears throat> right, uh, what I'm going to present is a quick screen on based on serology. Uh, we're taking on um, cattle and buffalo. This work is a collaborative work between National Museums of Kenya, Kenya Wildlife Service, Kenya Wildlife Research and, and Training Institute, University of Umea in Sweden, and now we are getting new collaborators from uh, Spain. <clears throat> I need to repeat this, that we are I'm presenting a serological data, but in the background, we are analyzing the, we are conducting PCR to see whether we can have confirmation from all the sample sets we have. We're also combining samples that we have collected over the years, plus freshly collected samples in the wild. I, I will just call it uh, Crimean Congo virus, but uh, the extended name is uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. That is the actual name, but for ease of communication, I'll just shorten it to Crimean Congo virus and I hope uh, you'll be able to catch me on that. <clears throat> well, it's not very new because the first uh, detection and discovery was way back in 1936, but it has a sporadic outbreaks and it has potential to cause communal infections in hospitals and case fatality rate is very high, ranging from 10 to 50%. Uh, if, if this is um, moderated poorly, you'll get an average of 30. So it's, it's as, as little as uh, many of the hemorrhagic fever viruses, which are sporadically reoccur in the continent of Africa. <clears throat> Previous reports in the, in the country, in Kenya, include a PCR confirmation of a fatal case in Western Kenya, way back in 2000. But the several studies in Kenya that have documented, that have conducted seroprevalence, both in human beings and uh, wildlife, as well as uh, in ticks. Um, despite all these studies from way back to 1936, hemorrhagic fever is not well explained in terms of how prevalent it is uh, within livestock, wildlife, and even human beings. Even though this caution that was provided by the Ministry of Health that uh, doctors need to be aware when they admit patients that, uh, that, that show tendencies of hemorrhage because it can set off to be an outbreak within the hospital and it would be difficult to get rid of. And with that high case fatality rate of 40, you can be sure even patients that could be saved could go down with this virus. <clears throat> In this study, we aimed at conducting the set of prevalence in management system that we thought could uh, influence persistent circulation as well as outbreak in, in human beings. So we looked at areas where wildlife are the main land use system like Nakuru National Park and uh, livestock are excluded. Human beings only go there as visitors or managers, as well as closed system 
with a bit of livestock and completely livestock go in and out like Masai Mara. And this is what we got. Um, I have some acronyms there which I'll explain. The bar chart on, your, on, the, on the left is a bit exaggerated because the samples were collected over eight years. So we don't pay too much close attention to it. We have to, I'm throwing caution in interpreting it. But the LNNP is the Liknakuru, which is closed. There is no livestock going in there. And we found very high sort of prevalence rate of Crimean Congo among the buffaloes. In all Pajeta, which is um, a conservancy and closed, they have livestock as well as um, wildlife. We found that uh, the sort of prevalence of uh, Crimean Congo among livestock was moderate, but buffaloes very low. In Masai Mara, the sort of prevalence moderate, you can call it moderate when we look at just the, the, the cattle. But when you look at the buffaloes, it was lower. I'll give you the actual figures here um, and I'll probably explain in my next three slides. We looked at buffaloes on their own and we looked at cattle on their own first and then we com made a comparison. And we saw that um, where there are no livestock, so the prevalence of Crimean Congo among buffaloes, very, very high. Where we have, li uh, where, where we have uh, cattle mixing with the buffaloes, the figure comes down significantly, but among the cattle, it shoots high, whether it is in a closed or a semi-closed. Closed here means closed for, for livestock and human beings. In Laikipia, where Alpajeta is, we did a small experiment. So, so one-off sampling of cattle outside the conservancy among the communities. And we found that the percentage of those tested uh, positive or show, showing exposure were low among the, the cattle. And of course, outside, uh, we didn't uh, get any buffaloes to, to sample and compare. So in conclusion, we found that uh, the exposure of uh, cattle and livestock in all the management systems is high, particularly areas where livestock, like in Masai Mara, where livestock go into the park, come out, and different uh, farm, uh, livestock keepers mix. This is different from where we have got one management system managing both livestock and wildlife in Old Pajeta, like Old Pajeta. In Old Pajeta, the, the conservancy is fenced off and the herds of cattle within the property remain constant. They don't mix with those that are, that are outside the conservancy area. The buffaloes or wildlife in general mix very freely with the livestock. And we think the vector that uh, the vector community that bites both livestock and wildlife are the same. The effect of land use system of keeping wildlife together with livestock helps to maintain Crimean Congo. And this is by sure of zero prevalence, which is a measure of uh, exposure. Uh, unfortunately, this conference has come too soon before I could get the PCR data. But of course, this is an indication that uh, Crimean Congo virus is circulating and maintained within both livestock and wildlife. We also do not have, I don't, I don't have yet the data for human beings, the livestock handlers within the areas where we sampled. So we don't know what the picture will be. But for sure, there is clear risks of transmission between livestock and wildlife as well as human being, particularly those that are handling. A previous study in Wajia in 2013 showed that uh, people who handle camels, goat, sheep, but to a less extent cattle are exposed. The sort of prevalence was as high as 40% in some cases in Wajia, but this was way back in 2013, which is nearly a decade.
we like to see this kind of uh, study in Masai Mara where some cattle keepers come from very far and go into the wildlife area, graze and leave. Whether they pick and drop the virus, we are not sure, but I think that will become clear, which are some of the gaps that our study is addressing in the next steps. We think the elevated um, exposure rates of buffalo in Lake Nakuru National Park is a unique event because the buffaloes don't mix with livestock in the park. Well, whereas the, the risk of transmitting it to human beings is very, is very low, except for those who are going for picnics who disembark from their vehicles and probably take a walk in the park and therefore get exposed to the ticks. We think that's very low. But the high prevalence rate of 90% of exposure in Lake Nakuru requires more investigation to see whether that exposure shows actual um, outbreak among the buffaloes or it was just a historical exposure. Probably a point to note as I wind up is that um, among the cattle, we found that younger, those that are two years and uh, lower were less exposed to the virus than the adult cows. The difference was as high as 50%. Because of time, I think I would like to just thank all those who supported us, particularly the Swedish Council for Research that are supporting the for institutions to collaborate, develop capacity to conduct research on neglected hemorrhagic fever pathogens that are potential to spread from human beings, from wildlife to livestock and human beings. I particularly thank also my colleagues from my university, Kenya Wildlife Service. And of course, I thank the organizers for bringing me in here. I uh, hope we could meet again when I have human and uh, other wildlife data, which we are currently analyzing. I hope I've made it in good time. Yes, actually you have a few minutes that we can ask a few, one or two questions. So many thanks for your presentation, Bernard. Um, I, di I did know though, like part of your slideshow, the zero prevalence among the wildlife that are in closed systems appear to be much higher than where you've got livestock. Did I get it right or wrong? I'm okay. They get it right that have a higher zero prevalence in areas that have only wildlife uh, compared to where you have cattle. And uh, what would be the reason for that? Are cattle serving as a as a dilution factor for for the zero prevalence or what? Yeah, uh, that was my ending point. That uh, the elevated high exposure rate of Crimean Congo among the buffaloes. I've just showed the data on buffaloes is uniquely high. Sorry, and I think uh, they could be right that we can impute the theory of dilution effect that uh, livestock would dilute <laughs> the, 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 the extremities of exposure. But we have to throw caution because this is exposure we're measuring. Once we get the PCR data, we will want to know the active, the active infections because um, exposure shows that uh, probably, and we were looking at uh, um, a case where some of our samples were collected way back in 2016 and others were collected in 2019. So we have to throw caution in interpreting the data, but it's true that could be cattle could be doing what we call the dilution effect. So or maybe you just sampled all the buffaloes. <laughs> That's a super small. One other question, uh, ticks. Um, I know the title indicates also, you know, infection in ticks, but I didn't see any data on that. Is that something you should be expecting? Sure, yeah. Uh, I was supposed to give you data also on ticks and um, on hyaloma ticks, but the data is not complete. <laughs> so I didn't want to have cook the, the, this honorable meeting with the tick data. Tick and human data is, um, is still in the kitchen. All right, uh, there might be maybe one question from the audience. Um, thank you so much, um, Bernard. We have a, a question from the um, participants online. Um, Annie McLeod um, congratulated you for a very interesting presentation and asks, do you have any information on how ticks are managed by livestock owning, com owning communities in your study areas, particularly the Masai Mara? Thank you. 
Yeah, we, we never conducted the household uh, interviews on how ticks are managed among the farmers. But we know for sure that um, different farmers have different ways of managing ticks. Some of them would go for, co for commercialized services or people who come and spray. And uh, some pay little attention to this. And this, this, this mix of uh, some are attending to ticks, some don't attend to ticks, is part of the reason why we think uh, in Masai Mara, the prevalence among cattle was a little bit higher compared to old vegeta, where they don't mix. The, the herds of cattle are kept in an enclosed, enclosed uh, property, and they don't mix with the communities who do not necessarily control ticks. So ticks are being controlled in different ways. And in Masai Mara particularly, each farmer would have different uh, intensity of, of management of ticks. 